approaching the valvular diseases on a USMLE and in real life can be really difficult because the uh, complications that come out of valvular diseases are so similar uh, when you compare the four major valvular diseases. Um, so what's really important when you approach any valvular disease when you're studying it is to know what's unique in each valvular disorder, to know uh, the, the distinguishing factors because you're going to see a lot of similar symptoms across the board, but if you know the distinguishing factors in each valvular disorder, that should make things a lot easier. But the valvular disorders have much more in common than they do apart. So some principles uh, applying to all valvular disorders. The valvular diseases are obviously diseases involving the cardiac valves. And the valve itself physiologically has two functions. So when it's open, it's supposed to allow the passage of blood flow. And when it's closed, it's supposed to retain the blood in the chamber and prevent backflow. So that's ideal. But uh, in, in disorders of, of the valves, what happens is when it's supposed to open, it doesn't allow passage of the blood flow. That's stenosis. Or when the valve is supposed to be closed, it's not retaining the blood in the chamber, and that's called regurgitation. So the most common etiology of valvular disease varies by specific valve, and we're going to talk about the most common etiology in the United States. Uh, worldwide, the most common cause of valvular disease in general is rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic uh, fever, but that's not a very common illness in the United States. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, the most common illnesses right here, and that's most pertinent for the USMLE. So as I mentioned, uh, the valves can be stenotic, uh, which means that the, the valves will not be able to open. And if they can't open, then they can't allow the passage of blood flow. Of course, it's not black and white. Uh, a valve can be stenotic and, and it can be disordered and it can still let some blood through, uh, but it's considered stenotic when, when symptoms begin to, uh, begin to present. The valve can also be regurgitant uh, or uh, Another word that's commonly used for regurgitant is incompetent. So what that means is the blood can't be retained by the valve. So uh, what all of the valvular diseases all have in common is that they always result in retarded flow through the cardiopulmonary circuit. So either because you're not be able to get blood through the valve or because the valve can't hold the blood and thus can't pump it to its next destination, the blood is going to get retarded through the cardiopulmonary circulation. And remember, just like in congestive heart failure, the problem that we get that leads to pulmonary edema, that leads to symptoms uh, that come out of congestive heart failure, the problem is that the blood is congested in the cardiopulmonary circuit. So we're going to see a lot of similar symptoms to congestive heart failure. Those are going to be your a lot of times the, the presenting symptom that the patient has. So you're going to see dyspnea, shortness of breath, fatigue, even hemoptysis. And this will be a lot of times in the patient that doesn't really have any risk factors for congestive heart failure. So they don't, maybe they don't have hypertension or they don't have prior history of MI or they don't have coronary artery disease. That should tip you off to valvular disorder. So you're going to see congestive heart failure symptoms in any patient with valvular diseases. You'll see other symptoms sometimes too, uh, but what you'll see in all valvular diseases um, save perhaps uh, mitral valve prolapse and uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which we'll discuss at the very end. What you will see in the, in the, uh, in the mitral and aortic valvular diseases are congestive heart failure symptoms. So the best initial test for any patient where you suspect valvular heart disease, if that is something that is your presumptive diagnosis and the question asks you, okay, what's the next best step in, in diagnosis of this patient, then your answer will be echocardiogram. That's the best test because it's the least expensive, the least invasive, and it allows us with very, very good accuracy uh, to see where, where the problem is. So echocardiogram is the best first step in diagnosis.
The most accurate test, though, for pinpointing the specific valvular heart disease, but not our first step, our first step is echocardiogram, the most accurate test is cardiac catheterization. So if it's a patient and the, uh, the presumptive diagnosis is a valvular disease and they ask you what's the most accurate test for the diagnosis of this patient, then it's cardiac catheterization. But if it says what's the best initial test or the best next step in the diagnosis of this patient, it's echocardiogram. So let's just overview the valvular diseases. We're going to talk about each one of these in, in detail. So as far as uh, the four major valvular diseases, uh, we've got mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, and aortic regurgitation. And I call these the four major ones because each of these uh, can require surgery. So mitral stenosis, number one etiology is rheumatic fever, which comes from uh, a group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infection that was not treated, usually strep throat. And the distinct history and symptoms will be systemic embolism, hoarseness, and AFib. That's a diastolic murmur. And uh, mitral regurgitation, number one etiology is ischemia and infarcts. Uh, aortic stenosis, number one etiology is aging. And aortic regurgitation, the number one etiology, tends to be idiopathic, but if we do know the cause, it tends to be hypertension. And then we'll talk about mitral valve prolapse and hyper hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or HOCAM. Uh, those are both congenital valvular diseases. Okay. So, mitral stenosis. So far and away, even in the United States, the number one cause is going to be rheumatic fever, which, as I mentioned, is due to a group A beta hemolytic strep infection. I'm just going to call that strep infection. Uh, so usually this is a pharyngeal strep infection from strep pyogenes. And what happens is when you develop rheumatic fever, you get calcifications of the mitral valve, and those calcifications are going to impede flow through the mitral valve. So what you get is a buildup of blood in the left atrium. And as you can imagine, in the left atrium, if you get a buildup of blood, you're gonna get left atrial hypertrophy, left atrial di dilation. So the, the common way that this presents, because mitral stenosis is generally mild and is generally not something that presents in and of itself. The classic way you get this is either in an older immigrant where this has been going on for a long time or in a patient that is pregnant and now because she's got a high volume state, because she's got more blood that's going to needs to be pumped through the heart, now you're starting to appreciate this murmur, or she may even have uh, some symptoms that are consistent with CHF that developed with the pregnancy. Because remember, pregnancy is a high volume state. Uh, the plasma volume increases pretty significantly. So look for a lot of times for this to present in a, either a pregnant patient or in an immigrant patient. So the left atrial pressure increases because blood can't be pumped uh, as, as properly through the mitral valve. So we get left atrial hypertrophy and dilation. And because the, the left atrium increases in size, but the conduction system doesn't change with it, what we get is a, an electromechanical dissociation. And so that causes atrial fibrillation. When you get, because the left atrium is in the most posterior position of the heart, uh, it can impede when it when it uh, dilates. It can impede on the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, and that can cause hoarseness, and that's what's known as Ortman's sign. You also because you get uh, because the flow from the left atrium decreases, you have some stasis of blood in the left atrium, and any time blood slows down, it's more apt to form an embolus. So you can get emboli formation and those emboli can be uh, shot out through the uh, into the aorta and can uh, go up usually it goes up through uh, through the jugular uh, or th sorry through the carotid artery and that can cause a uh, a stroke so strokes and TIAs are are uh, not common but an increased risk in in patients with mitral valve stenosis um, and then also uh, atrial fibrillation itself, which comes from the left atrial dilation, uh, 
can uh, that itself also because it causes AFib is also a risk factor for stasis and emboli formation. Okay, so when do we hear the murmur? We hear it during diastole. Why do we hear it during diastole? Well, what is the murmur? The murmur is when the blood is flowing through the valve. And so the blood flows through the mitral valve during diastole. Remember, diastole is ventricular filling. The ventricles relax, blood flows through the mitral and tricuspid valves for that matter. So blood is flowing through the mitral valve while the, uh, while the ventricle is, is, is relaxed. And so because we have that stenosis, we get a murmur. It's kind of like if you were to, if you blow through a, uh, a, a, uh, a toilet paper holder, like a, a uh, or like a, um, a, uh, a tube, like a tube that holds, that holds wrapping paper, you don't hear much of a noise, but if you blow through a straw, you're going to hear a much louder noise. So you have more turbulence. And that's what we hear in the murmur. So the murmur is diastolic in mitral valve stenosis. So here's why we get the hoarseness. Uh, here's our right atrium and our right ventricle here. This is a left lateral view of the heart. So you're looking at it from the left side, uh, looking towards the right side. And then here's the left ventricle and the left atrium. And the left recurrent laryngeal nerve comes off the vagus nerve and goes back up. Uh, and the way it goes up is it goes uh, sort of behind the heart here and then in between uh, the pulmonary arteries and the uh, aorta and, and transcends upward. And so because it goes right behind the left atrium, if the left atrium gets dilated, it can impede on the left recurrent laryngeal nerve and thus cause hoarseness. So what to look for in any patient uh, that you may think of as having possible mitral valve stenosis, the patient that gets presented on the USMLE stereotypically has had a history of rheumatic fever. Uh, they are also likely to be pregnant. That's a common way uh, to, for mitral stenosis to manifest itself. Uh, a lot of times they're going to be immigrants and in their history you'll often be able to find a prior untreated uh, group A strep infection. The symptoms are going to be primarily your CHF symptoms, uh, shortness of breath, dyspnea fatigue, and hemoptysis. Like I said, particularly in a pregnant patient or in an immigrant patient that doesn't have any other risk factors for congestive heart failure, a lot of times you'll see hoarseness, and it could also be in a patient with history of TIA or systemic emboli. On physical exam, you will hear a diastolic murmur, and it's best appreciated at the apex. And uh, the initial test is going to be an echocardiogram, as I mentioned. So any any time you suspect a, 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 a valvular defect, you should get a, a, an echocardiogram. You should also order an EKG on these patients. Of course, the best first step is an echocardiogram, but you should also get an EKG um, as your next step in the management of this patient because we because this has such a, a, there's such a high occurrence of atrial fibrillation, we want to see if that's there because that's gonna change the management of the patient. So we look for, on EKG, we look for right ventricular hypertrophy uh, because you're getting uh, block up in the cardiopulmonary circuit, uh, proximal to the left ventricle, and then atrial fibrillation because we're getting dilation of the left atrium. So the treatment for mitral valve stenosis is going to be preload reduction. Uh, with, uh, with any kind of diastolic murmur, you're going to give the patient diuretics. So that's something important to remember. Diastolic murmur equals diuretics. So we give preload reduction, and uh, the sodium-restricted diet does the same thing essentially as diuretics. It reduces the volume. And so we give sodium-restricted diet and diuretics. And the diuretic we tend to use is Lasix or furosemide. If atrial fibrillation is indeed present on EKG, then we're going to give the patient digoxin and warfarin. So you might be wondering why we're giving the patient digoxin when they have atrial fibrillation. If you watch the congestive heart failure slides, you'd remember that digoxin is a positive inotrope. 
which is usually given in systolic congestive heart failure, and that's true, but digoxin also is an antiarrhythmic, and it's particularly useful when treating atrial fibrillation. So we give digoxin not for its positive inotrope properties, but because it, it helps with the, uh, with the uh, arrhythmia of atrial fibrillation. So digoxin and then warfarin, because these patients are with AFib are at risk for developing clots. So digoxin and warfarin and diuretics for the, uh, for the murmur itself. So diuretics, digoxin, and warfarin are the management for mitral valve stenosis uh, if the patient has AFib and diuretics if they just have the mitral valve stenosis. The surgery after, uh, so when we do surgery, it's generally after the patient has failed medical treatment. And the options include balloon valvuloplasty or valve replacement. If we need to do this on a pregnant patient, because remember this often presents in pregnant women, uh, then we're going to do a balloon valvuloplasty. And really balloon valvuloplasty was invented for pregnant patients because uh, having open heart surgery would obviously be a, a serious risk to the fetus. So balloon valvuloplasty tends to be preferred, but we can also do open valve replacement. And mitral valve stenosis, uh, none of the mitral problems require antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, ex with the exception of mitral valve prolapse in, in some cases. So mitral stenosis never requires antibiotic prophylaxis. So moving on to mitral valve regurgitation, uh, the number one cause for mitral regurgitation is ischemia or infarction. And the simple reason for this is that the reason we get mitral regurgitation is because the leaflets in the mitral valve get separated. What would cause the leaflets in the mitral valves to get separated? It's dilation of the heart itself, left ventricular dilation. So left ventricular dilation is the primary cause uh, and left ventricular dilation is behind the primary symptoms. So these patients are going to have prominent congestive heart failure symptoms. They're gonna have prominent congestive heart failure symptoms because not only does their disease that caused the mitral regurgitation cause congestive heart failure symptoms, but now the mitral regurgitation itself is going to cause the congestive cause congestive heart failure symptoms. So these patients are already at risk for congestive heart failure because mitral regurgitation is so associated with ischemia and infarction, which remember leads to systolic congestive heart failure. So they're having significant congestive heart failure symptoms. Not only do they have generally systolic congestive heart failure, but now their mitral regurgitation due to the, uh, the separation of the leaflets, now that is actually causing congestive heart failure symptoms in addition to their systolic CHF. So their symptoms are going to be dyspnea, fatigue, orthopnea, pulmonary edema, and a lot of times you're gonna hear S3 on auscultation. Why? Because we're going to have blood that's remaining in the left ventricle, and uh, like any CHF, like any patient who's got a dilated heart, and uh, because we have blood remaining in the left ventricle, uh, when blood comes into the left ventricle from the left atrium, you're going to hear uh, the mixing of that blood, and that's going to be your S3 murmur. The murmur here is going to be systolic. So why is the murmur going to be systolic? Well, when does blood regurgitate? It regurgitates when something is getting constricted. So what's getting constricted here? The left ventricle. The left ventricle contracts, blood cannot be retained by the mitral valve. So it goes through, back through the mitral valve in reverse motion. So the murmur here will be systolic. And so the blood flows and regurgitates back through the incompetent valve during systole. And specifically, this is going to be a holosystolic murmur. The acute cause, so now we know what can chronically cause mitral regurgitation, just having ischemia, coronary artery disease, infarction, all the risk factors for systolic congestive heart failure. What can acutely cause mitral regurgitation in a patient that didn't have a holosystolic murmur before is rupture of the chordae tendinae. And if we go back here, the chordae tendinae are these big white things, the, the, these muscle here, that, uh, that hold the, the uh, mitral valve in place. 
And so when that gets ruptured, the mitral valve just completely loses its ability to hold blood. So this is an acute cause. And when do we see rupture of the chordae tendineae? We see this in a patient who is post-MI. So because of the infarction, the infarction has killed off uh, muscle that's supporting the chordae tendineae, and it just suddenly ruptures. So look for acute mitral regurgitation in a patient that has rupture of the chordae tendineae. And these tend to be patients that are post-MI two to five days roughly, and they'll have a sudden rapid onset of dyspnea. And these patients, obviously, you can't treat them medically because this is so significant. You have an actual rupture rather than a, rather than a chronic uh, dilation. So these patients, you're gonna get an immediate echo to confirm that this is the diagnosis because you don't wanna open them up if, if you don't know for sure. And then you'll send these patients off to surgery. Uh, for more information on this, you can go to the uh, complications of MI. Uh, this is a major complication of MI. So uh, recapping mitral regurgitation, so the history that you'll uh, frequently see in patients who have mitral regurgitation is a patient with previous MIs, a patient with systolic congestive heart failure, uh, ischemia, and infarctions. The symptoms of mitral valve regurgitation are going to be primarily your CHF symptoms. You don't really see any symptoms in mitral regurgitation that are outside the norm uh, in, in, uh, in valvular disease. So dyspnea, shortness of breath, orthopnea, and pulmonary edema. Now on physical exam, you will hear some, you will see some, some unique things. So you'll hear a systolic murmur that's best appreciated at the apex. A lot of times you're gonna hear the S3 heart sound. That's not as common in the other valvular defects because congestive heart failure is not necessarily present with the other uh, heart defects. With, with this one, with mitral regurgitation, congestive heart failure is, is almost always associated with mitral regurgitation. So you'll hear the S3 heart sound, you'll hear wheezing, rails, ronchi, and jugular venous distension. So a very much congestive heart failure picture, but you'll have that systolic murmur too that doesn't come with congestive heart failure itself. The initial test, as always, will be an echocardiogram, and of course you'll want, you're will you going to want to get an EKG. A chest x-ray will also be prudent because you're going to want to uh, see what the exact, uh, what the severity is of the, uh, the symptoms. Um, so as far as seeing how much pulmonary edema there is, uh, see if you're going to need uh, to do any emergent treatment so the treatment here is going to vary in uh, patients with acute mitral regurgitation, so like that patient that has the chordae tendine rupture, you're going to want to get this patient into surgery. And you can also give them furosemide while they're waiting, and that will, uh, that will get some of the fluid off their lungs, but these patients are gonna need surgery. In non-emergent cases, in chronic cases, where patients come in with the dyspnea, shortness of breath, et cetera, and they have that murmur at the apex, that systolic murmur, we're going to do afterload reduction. And so we're gonna give these patients nitrates and ACE inhibitors. And it's basically the same thing we do for congestive heart failure. So if they're not already on that for congestive heart failure, that's what we're gonna do for them. So nitroglycerin and ACE inhibitor, usually we use captopril. So after load reduction uh, for a systolic murmur, uh, unlike a diastolic murmur where we use diuretics. Um, of course, in any valvular defect, if there could be atrial fibrillation present on the EKG, if there is, then we'll give them digoxin and warfarin. And these patients, we will uh, replace the valve if uh, their left ventricular ejection fraction drops below 60%, or their left ventricular end systemic diameter is above 45 millimeters. And the only way you're gonna be able to know that is on echocardiogram. So less than 60% ejection fraction, greater than 45 uh, end systolic diameter. Uh, and mitral regurgitation, like just like mitral uh, stenosis, it, uh, does not require antibiotic prophylaxis. Okay, so moving on to the aortic valve, so the valve that, that separates the left ventricle from the aorta, the number one cause of aortic stenosis is normal aging, calcification of the valve. So this just comes as normal. You don't have to have any predisposing factor uh, to get aortic stenosis other than an old age. Uh, 
The most common presentation for aortic stenosis is CHF-like symptoms, so your dyspnea, fatigue, and orthopnea. But some unique presentations of aortic stenosis, when you hear the systolic murmur that comes with aortic stenosis, is chest pain and syncope. So we wouldn't expect chest pain or syncope in a patient with, with congestive heart failure symptoms alone. So if the patient has congestive heart failure symptoms, but they also present with chest pain or they present with syncope, then you should think possibly aortic stenosis. Now, I put a star next to chest pain because if any older patient comes in with chest pain, you really should get an EKG first. Uh, unless there's something to tell you, that the, obviously, that the chest pain is from somewhere else. But I'm going to tell you, you really should think chest pain, older patient, equals EKG. Uh, that, that will save you a lot of lives. Murmur uh, in aortic stenosis is going to be systolic. So remember, uh, so remember back to mitral stenosis. That's a diastolic murmur because you're getting blood going through the stenotic valve. But when blood goes through the, the mitral valve, it's during diastole. When blood goes through the aortic valve, it's during systole. So blood going through a stenotic valve uh, is going to cause your murmur, and blood goes through the aortic valve during systole. So this will be a systolic murmur, and particularly this will be a crescendo-decrescendo murmur. So the characteristic physical finding on aortic stenosis that you're going to see a lot on the USMLE, it's kind of hard to detect it in, uh, in real life, but you'll hear it uh, on the USMLE, and it should be somewhat, uh, a somewhat obvious uh, uh, auscultation if they give you the actual, uh, the actual sound of it, on the, if they, they give you the multimedia of it. Uh, it's the paradoxical S2 split. So let's talk about the sort of the pathophysiology behind that. So first of all, what is an S2 split? So an S2 split is what happens normally. Uh, S2 splits are totally normal. If you oscillate yourself, you'll hear it. So what normally happens is that the pulmonary valve closes slightly after the aortic valve. So remember S1 is the closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves, and the S2 is the closure of the aortic and, and pulmonary valves. So Normally, the pulmonary valve closes just a little bit after the aortic valve. That's, that's normal. Um, it's not a lot. It's usually not even enough to even notice it. So during expiration, when, you don't, when, when, you're, you're, uh, when your lungs are not, uh, are not expanded, uh, the, the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve are going to close at approximately the same time. And that's just simply because you don't have much room in your, uh, in your lungs for blood to flow. Now compare that to inspiration, hopefully this will make it a little more clear. When you expand your lungs, you have more room, you have less pressure in your lungs. And so because there's less pressure in, in your lungs, there's less pressure in the pulmonary arteries, more blood will flow from the right ventricle into the, the pulmonary flow. And so what actually happens is because there's less pressure in the blood, because more blood is flowing through the pulmonary valve, the pulmonary valve will actually close later. And so what you get is during expiration, you really only hear, I put two of them here just to make it kind of clear, but you really only hear one S2 sound. So you hear lub dub, lub dub. During inspiration, you can clearly hear the, uh, the, the splitting between the aortic valve, which closes at the same time, and the pulmonary valve, which closes later because there's less pressure in the pulmonary uh, vasculature. And so you'll hear lub da dum lub da dum lub da dum Now, let's contrast this to aortic stenosis. In aortic stenosis, the aortic valve is stenotic, and it has a hard time... Uh, 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 closing completely. So uh, I probably didn't say that the right way. Um, the, the sound comes later in aortic stenosis. Let's just put it that way. I don't want to confuse you. Um, so uh, during expiration, when we would normally hear one heart sound, because the aortic valve is so retarded in its, in its closure, what we get is 
are splitting during expiration. And that's, be, not, that's because the aortic valve has, it, not because the pulmonary valve is closing later, it's because the aortic valve is closing way later. And so actually what you're getting is a split, but, but because the aortic valve is closing after the pulmonary valve rather than the other way around. So you're gonna get your split during expiration. Now compare this to inspiration. Yeah, your pulmonary valve is going to close later just as normal. But because our aortic valve is closed so much late, when the pulmonary valve closes later, now the two sounds sound like one because they're closer together. So you have during expiration a split and during inspiration, even though your pulmonary valve is closing later, it's now met up with the, the later closing aortic valve and so you get no split. And so this is paradoxical because you get splitting during expiration instead of during inspiration, which is the opposite of the way it should be. So that is a paradoxical S2 split, and it happens during aortic stenosis. So history of patients with aortic stenosis, generally there's not going to be any remarkable history. It'll almost always be an older patient, and they'll have CHF-like symptoms, but they may have also uh, chest pain or syncope. So uh, on physical exam, you'll hear the systolic ejection murmur, uh, particularly uh, your crescendo-decrescendo murmur. Paradoxical S2 splitting is, is very unique to aortic stenosis. Another thing that you'll see is pulsus tardis at parvus. And what that is, is it's Latin for, uh, for late and weak pulse. So because the aortic valve is so stenosed, it's hard for blood to get up into the systemic circulation. So you'll have your pulse, because your pulse that you feel, that you auscultate, is, is just noises from the heart. But when you auscultate, when you feel, I, I should say, when you palpate the, the pulse and let's say the carotid artery, what you're feeling there is blood moving. And so because blood is not moving as quickly as it should because your valve is stenotic, you're going to have a separation between your pulse and your and your uh, the 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 noise that you hear in in your stethoscope and the pulse that you feel in your carotid artery. Um, so hopefully I made that make sense. So you hear your heart sound as normal, but blood is not able to get up to systemic arteries like the carotid artery, for instance. And so what you feel will come much later, uh, and it will be weaker because you have a stenotic. Uh, aortic valve. So uh, a weak pulse and a uh, late pulse, pulsus tardis at parvus. Uh, carotid thrill uh, is often common uh, and that's just simply because it's the, uh, it's the, so if you auscultate the carotid artery what you get is, is sort of the whoosh 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 sound and that's just a, uh, a projection of the noise uh, of the murmur uh, coming from the aortic valve. So you're getting a murmur, um, but it's coming from the aortic valve and you're hearing it in the carotid, uh, in the carotid artery. You may have an S4 murmur, uh, and that's simply due to the fact that you're getting some, uh, some hypertrophic cardiomyopathy here. Uh, because the aortic valve is stenosed, obviously the left ventricle is going to have to pump harder against that gradient, and so you can get some hypertrophy of the uh, left ventricle, and that will cause an S4 murmur, which remember is, S4 murmur is just your blood uh, bumping up against a hypertrophied uh, myocardium in the left ventricle. So excluding the presence, so when you get a patient like this and you're suspecting aortic stenosis, if the patient doesn't have angina type chest pain, um, in which case you would get an EKG if they did, the best initial test on suspicion of aortic stenosis, like any valvular disease, is an echocardiogram. Now the way we treat these patients is a little different. With aortic stenosis, there's really no effective medical therapy. The only effective therapy is surgical. That doesn't mean we have to do surgery right away. Uh, if the patient isn't healthy enough for surgery right now, we can hold off, um, provided that the aortic valvular orifice is less than 0.8 centimeters squared. So we want to get the echocardiogram to see how uh, uh, see how uh, how much aortic orifice they have, how stenosed their their aortic valve is. So if it's greater than 0.8 centimeters squared, we can hold off on the surgery. You could do surgery if you want, it would be recommended, but you can hold off. Um, 
but then uh, if they if you do the echocardiogram and their their aortic valve is stenosed to less than 0 0.8 centimeters squared, then you're going to want to have surgery. And uh, the way I remember 0 0.8 centimeters squared as being the cutoff, uh, I like to use mnemonics. I just remember that there's four letters in the word, uh, or sorry, eight letters in the word stenosis. So 0 0.8 centimeters squared is the cutoff. Um, and you'll see that on echocardiogram. So remember, less than 0 0.8 centimeters squared, surgery. And these patients need surgery because they're getting that hypertrophy in their left ventricle. And eventually, that you'll go from a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to a dilated cardiomyopathy. You can't you can't hypertrophy your heart forever. And once you go into dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, the, the patient has a very, 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 very low uh, one-year survival rate, which I think is about 10%. Patients with aortic stenosis, if you're not tr giving them surgery yet, then in the meantime, they are going to require antibiotic prophylaxis. Okay, finally, uh, capping off the mitral and aortic uh, defects, we'll talk about aortic regurgitation. So the number one cause in the United States is long-standing hypertension. Uh, it's worth noting, however, that you can see aortic regurgitation. You often see pa uh, aortic regurgitation in patients with connective tissue disorders, so like Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. You can see it in patients with syphilitic aortitis, and you can see it in, uh, you will see it in patients with aortic dissection or aortic trauma. Now, while it's very common in these patients, these patients aren't very common. So you're, the, the number one cause is longstanding hypertension. And um, the best way to think of why it happens in patients with longstanding hypertension is to just think, when you have hypertension, does blood want to go into the systemic circulation or not? It's difficult to pump blood into systemic circulation when there's a high pressure there. So if, uh, if you have long-standing hypertension, blood can regurgitate back into the, uh, into the left ventricle. So the most common presentation is shortness of breath, dyspnea, and palpitations. Uh, typically your congestive heart failure-like symptoms, particularly though in a patient with long-standing hypertension. So uh, these patients do suffer from a chronically high left ventricular preload because blood has been coming back in to the aorta, or coming back in, sorry, from the left ventricle, into the left ventricle from the aorta. And so because you have this high left ventricular preload, you get left ventricular hypertrophy because blood has been regurgitating back into the left ventricle. So you have this high load in the left ventricle. So that causes left ventricular hypertrophy. So these patients can have that. The murmur will be diastolic. Why? Well, when is blood going to go back into the left ventricle to cross the aorta? Remember, regurgitation is retrograde flow. It's going back Backwards. When is it going to cross the aortic valve? It's going to cross the aortic valve when the ventricle is relaxing, because when the ventricle relaxes, the pressure decreases enough for blood to move back downwards. And so you will hear this murmur during diastole. So this will be a diastolic murmur. And you will appreciate this murmur at the right costal margin, at the right sternal border. So, uh, some of the findings that the USMLE likes to throw at you, I'm not going to say I've ever seen these findings in real life, nor will, uh, I don't think a lot of people have ever seen some of these things in real life um, as far as these signs, but they're, they're old-fashioned, uh, very, 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 very pathognomonic things that the USMLE likes to throw at you to see if, if you've been, been reading your physiology book. So... Remember these names because they mean aortic regurgitation. So Quinky's pulse is where the nail beds change color from normal to pale along with the pulses. And really the way to think of all of these is just what you're getting is blood goes up uh, and then it comes back down really fast into the left ventricle, back into the left ventricle. So you're getting this high pulse pressure. You're getting a lot of blood pumped up because the left ventricle has a lot of blood in it to pump up. So you have a high systolic pressure, but then during diastole, blood just rapidly comes back down in the left ventricle, causing a low diastolic pressure. Um, so you'll get Quinky's pulse with the nail beds. Watson's water hammer pulse is just what's known as a bounding pulse. They'll probably tell you bounding pulses rather than Watson's water hammer pulse. Uh, De Musset sign is, uh, this actually is one thing that I have seen uh, in one patient 
uh, when I was a medical student uh, with aortic regurge. And what this is, is when the patient's heart beats, you get a sort of a movement of their head, almost like they're very slightly bowing towards you. And, and that's uh, de Musset sign. De Rosier's sign is simply where you hear that typical diastolic murmur that you would normally auscultate over the, the right costal margin. Uh, you'll hear that uh, on auscultation of the femoral artery. So it, it just transmits down to the femoral artery. And then another thing that you can hear in uh, aortic regurgitation is the Austin Flint murmur. And what that is, is it's kind of similar to an S3. Uh, it's blood coming back down, uh, the regurgitant blood coming back down from the aorta into the left ventricle and colliding with the, the, uh, the blood that has remained in the left ventricle. So that's the Austin Flint murmur. And you'll hear that murmur as just this sort of very slight diastolic rumble uh, at the cardiac apex. That's where you'll hear it the best. Um, so you'll have an Austin Flint murmur, and you, can have the, you will have the, the murmur at the right costal margin. So with the aortic regurgitation, you're going to, often on the USMLE, you're going to see the patient with a history of long-standing hypertension. You may also have a younger patient with connective tissue diseases like Ehlers-Danlos or Marfan syndrome, or you could have a patient with untreated syphilis. Uh, but in real life, most commonly, this is going to be uh, an, an older patient with no risk factors for congestive heart failure, um, and they've got long-standing hypertension, and now they're developing CHF symptoms. So the symptoms are going to be the CHF-like symptoms in general, um, really no specific symptoms per se uh, in, for aortic regurgitation. What's going to be more specific is what you see on physical exam, and that's going to be on uh, your, you'll see this on your blood pressure, you'll see a wide pulse pressure, and uh, the more the patient, uh, the higher the patient's blood pressure goes, the more prominent this wide pulse pressure will be. So at resting, they might just be 130 over 65, and that's not really that big of a deal. But when they become, when, when they, for instance, if they exercise, or if their blood pressure goes up for, for any reason, you might see 160 over 70, or 180 over, that, that should not happen. You know, the, 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 the systolic and the diastolic will, the systolic should be higher than diastolic, of course, but they shouldn't be to the point, uh, you know, where it really jumps out at you and you look at that and you're like, wow, did the nurse take that right? So uh, you'll have a wide pulse pressure on, uh, on your blood pressure. Uh, then you'll see a diastolic murmur, at, or you'll hear a diastolic murmur uh, at the right sternal border, uh, like any aortic uh, uh, murmur. And then, of course, you'll see the various findings, or you may see the various findings related to wide pulse pressure. Um, you'll probably, like I said, most important to know this for the USMLE, you're not going to really see this that much in real life. You'll see far more aortic regurge patients um, w without them than, w than with these wide pulse pressure symptoms. But you will see wide pulse pressure on b blood pressure on their vitals and then that, that diastolic murmur uh, at the right sternal border. Those are two things that, that you will see in real life and you should remember for the USMLE. So in any patient, regardless of what they come in with, if they have chest pain and it's anginal, regardless of what you think they have, they need an EKG because MI is the number one thing that can kill them immediately. So uh, even if it's a patient that comes in with a wide pulse pressure and a diastolic murmur and they've got angina, you've got to think of, uh, of, of something like an MI. So get an EKG. Uh, the best initial test on suspicion of aortic stenosis, though, uh, once you've excluded chest pain, uh, MI of chest pain, is, uh, is echocardiogram. Uh, that's good uh, to establish diagnosis of any, like I've said many times now, of any valvular disease. So the treatment here, uh, because it's a diastolic murmur, we're going to give them diuretics. So preload reduction, sodium-restricted diet, diet, and diuretics, and we tend to give them furosemide. We do surgery on these patients uh, when their left ventricular ejection fraction has gone down below 55% uh, or their left ventricular and stasolic diameter is greater than 55 millimeters. Obviously, the only way you're going to see this is on echocardiogram, so we monitor these patients, and once they go below these levels, then we, we need to do surgery. Uh, so 
less than 55%, greater than 55 millimeters, either or, it doesn't have to be both. And patients with any aortic defect, they need antibiotic prophylaxis. Okay, so mitral valve prolapse is something that you're going to see more commonly in younger patients, uh, or it presents more often in younger patients than the other ones we've been talking about. And this tends to present in women more than men, uh, for whatever reason. And the most common presentation with mitral valve prolapse is chest pain, palpitations, and panic. I don't know why the panic comes out of it. I don't know why the palpitations come out of it. I don't know why the chest pain comes out of it. That's just the way it is. So remember, pain, palpitations, and panic for mitral valve prolapse. Um, so the murmur that you're going to hear very characteristically in mitral valve prolapse, and you've probably already been, uh, been conditioned into seeing, oh, systolic click, mitral valve prolapse. And that's really the way you should stay, because that's how it's going to be on the USMLE. Um, Mid-systolic click uh, from is, is diagnostic of mitral valve prolapse. Do we need to treat mitral valve prolapse? Not necessarily. If you're doing a physical exam on this patient, they're just coming in for an unrelated reason, and you hear a mid-systolic click, you can say, oh, you've got a murmur. Uh, and a lot of patients will tell you when you get a history on them, oh, yeah, I've got a history of a murmur. And it usually is mitral valve prolapse because it's so common and it's congenital. Uh, so if it's asymptomatic, you don't have to do a workup, you don't have to do echocardiogram, you don't have to treat them. The only time we do a workup and treatment is when there's symptoms present. So the patient comes in with chest pain, they have palpitations, they have panic, and then you hear a mid-systolic click. Then we're going to do uh, a workup because this patient's having symptoms and we want to see how severe it is. So the, the, the workup for the patient will be an echocardiogram. Uh, and we're going so we can see how severe the the mitral valve prolapse is, and uh, once we see that, then we will know if we need to do any other uh, workup. Now, if the patient, okay, so think of what mitral valve prolapse is. What you're getting is the mitral valve prolapsing in to the uh, in, into the left ventricle. So because of that, you will have a little bit of regurgitation because the valve has prolapsed into the left ventricle. So there's room for blood to come back down. Uh, so if there's a mitral regurgitation murmur, so remember that's a systolic murmur over the apex, then you're going to need to give the patient antibiotic prophylaxis. But otherwise, you don't. So sometimes you give mitral valve prolapse patients antibiotic prophylaxis. It's only if they have a mitral regurgitation murmur. Uh, only if they have a systolic murmur over the apex. They will have a mid-systolic click. The mid-systolic click is not really a murmur per se. It's just a click sounding. It's just the sound of that, that prolapse. If it's accompanied with a mitral regurgitation murmur, a systolic murmur over the apex, then you give them antibiotic prophylaxis because you have regurgitant flow. But remember, mitral regurgitation itself does not require antibiotic prophylaxis. Just mitral regurgitation in the setting of mitral valve prolapse requires antibiotic prophylaxis. Mitral valve pro prolapse alone, no prophylaxis. Mitral regurgitation alone, no prophylaxis. Mitral valve prolapse with mitral regurgitation murmur, prophylaxis. Okay? Uh, for the patients that have the chest pain, the palpitations, the panic, you can give them beta blockers for their pain. Uh, metoprolol will be fine for that. Okay, uh, so, um, oh, one other thing. This uh, mid-systolic click, it worsens with a Valsalva maneuver. So what is Valsalva maneuver? Okay, so the best way to think of Valsalva maneuver, what it does is it reduces blood flow to the heart. Why? Well, when you're straining, you're, re you're reducing blood flow to the heart because your abdomen is compressing your uh, vena cava. So the way I remember this is, if I don't know if any of you guys have been to a sports game, and you know how at, uh, in, in the restrooms, how the urinals, they usually just like trow you up there, and you've got like other guys standing around you, and it's kind of embarrassing. And me personally, I have no problem sharing this. I have a shy bladder. So I have a hard time going in, in, when, when there's other people around me. And, and you can strain so hard, and it happened to me one time at a hockey game. I almost passed out uh, on the floor. Uh, 
So, uh, I mean, you can't imagine what a more filthy place to, to pass out on the floor. But that was a Valsalva maneuver reducing blood flow to my heart. And so what happens during a Valsalva maneuver, you reduce blood flow to the heart. Now, in mitral valve prolapse, when there's less blood flowing through the heart, you're going to hear that, that prolapse valve click a lot louder because you don't have blood flow going through there as much. So the mitral valve prolapse murmur, the click, is going to worsen with Valsalva because there's less blood flow, uh, uh, less blood flow on top of it. So you hear the prolapse much louder when there's less blood uh, uh, hiding it. And it's going to improve with squatting or with leg raises. Squatting and leg raises increase blood flow to the heart. I don't know why. Well, leg raises, you're getting more blood down from your lower extremity. I don't know about squatting. But uh, worsen with Valsalva, improve with squatting. All right. So uh, hokum is idiopathic, and you're going to see this most frequently in teens and young adults, very stereotypically in athletes. And it's, uh, the reason is because in athletes, it commonly uh, leads to syncope and sudden death. So uh, what hokum is, is it's an uh, enlargement of the uh, intraventricular septum. And what can happen is that the septum can enlarge so much that it blocks the outflow tract. So basically you're blocking the, uh, between the left ventricle and the aortic valve. And so because you're blocking it, you're, you will get a murmur. Uh, it will be a systolic murmur, just like what you would hear uh, during during uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, if symptomatic, uh, you're going to have symptoms that range from chest pain, but it could also be syncope or sudden death, which would be due to arrhythmia. Now, you hear a systolic murmur. You hear a displaced apical impulse. What do you normally hear a systolic murmur and a displaced apical impulse in? Aortic stenosis. But these patients don't have aortic stenosis. Why? Aortic stenosis comes with age. These patients tend to be young. They're otherwise healthy. They're athletes. They're, they're young adults. They're not patients who are 70 years old and have developed atrial or aortic stenosis, which, remember, is due to age. So these are young and healthy people. Uh, and they come in with syncope, chest pain, or sudden death on exertion. That's hokum. And this is going to worsen with Valsalva and improve with squatting. Now, this is really important that it worsens with Valsalva. Because uh, blood flow is good for, uh, for hokum. And the reason is because the more blood you have flowing through, the more it's going to keep that, uh, that hypertrophied septum, that blocking portion of the septum, from actually blocking the outflow tract. So when you have less blood moving through, it's easier for that, that septum to get in the way. Uh, and so you're going to hear a much stronger murmur uh, in, uh, in, in patients with, uh, uh, that are doing Valsalva maneuver. And it's going to improve with squatting because you're getting more blood into your heart. And so it's going to push that, that, uh, that, that septum out of the way. And so you won't hear the, the murmur as much. The diagnosis here is going to be echocardiogram. And then the treatment is simply uh, avoidance. So we abstain from vigorous activity. Surgical therapy is available, but it's not ever going to be your choice in the USMLE. And then we advise the patient to maintain hydration at all times. Why? Because dehydration is what will uh, reduce blood flow, and that's going to re reduce volume. Uh, and that's going to be what actually aggravates the murmur. And when you aggravate the murmur, you're reducing your, uh, your blood flow, and you're, reducing, uh, you're increasing your your obstruction. Okay, so just to recap, so any of the uh, the mitral or aortic problems, uh, there. I want to first point out that all of these are going to uh, get sound better with Valsalva. So the the murmur with mitral stenosis, mitral regurge, aortic stenosis, aortic regurge, they're all going. The murmur is always going to be less with Valsalva because the the murmur that you hear in these four are due to blood moving through the, uh, the, the lesion. So when you have less blood, you're going to have less of a murmur. So uh, whereas in MVP or in hokum, the murmur itself is due to, uh, is due to the, uh, it's due to the, um, 
well, it's either due to the, the prolapsed valve making noise, making a click, or it's due to the septum that gets pushed out of the way with more blood volume. So MVP and hokum both, uh, the, the murmur gets louder with Valsalfa. Okay, so let's just recap here. Uh, mitral stenosis, you'll see rheumatic fever, immigrant, pregnant as part of your history, symptoms and physical, no antibiotics needed. Uh, it's a diastolic murmur. Mitral regurgitation, you're gonna see coronary artery disease, ischemia, infarction, systolic, CHF, uh, anything that causes dilation of the heart uh, as part of your history. You'll hear a pan-systolic murmur, no antibiotics needed. Aortic stenosis comes with age. You'll hear an S2 paradoxical split, pulsus tardis at parvus, and uh, you'll hear a systolic crescendo-decrescendo murmur. Any aortic defect, you're going to need uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. Aortic regurge, it's systemic hypertension. You'll see the wide pulse pressure. You'll see all those funny named uh, eponymous syndromes. Uh, and connective tissue disease can also be associated with aortic regurgitation. The murmurs you'll hear uh, in aortic regurge are diastolic, heard over the, uh, over the right costal margin, and uh, you're gonna get the Austin Flint murmur oftentimes over the apex. The antibiotics here will be needed. With mitral valve prolapse, you're gonna often see this in females uh, who present with panic, palpitations, and pain. The murmur is going to be a mid-systolic click. Uh, it's going to get worse with Valsalva, the murmur will get louder with Valsalva, and you only need antibiotics if the patient also has a concurrent regurgitant murmur, a concurrent systolic murmur. Uh, so with hokum, you're gonna see this in the young patient who's an athlete, they present with syncope and sudden death, or sudden death. Uh, the murmur here will be systolic and it will be crescendo, decrescendo murmur like aortic stenosis. It's really, it's kind of the same thing, but it's a different etiology. So you're just getting blockage of the outflow tract. That's what it has in common with aortic stenosis. What's different though, is that it's not due to the valve, it's due to a septal uh, hypertrophy. And no antibiotic uh, need for hokum. Uh, so the treatment for mitral stenosis is going to be a preload reduction. Any uh, diastolic murmur, mitral stenosis and aortic regurgitation are both diastolic murmurs. Uh, any diastolic murmur gets a diuretic, so furosemide. And we do surgery when symptoms persist after maximal medical treatment. Mitral regurgitation, we need uh, afterload reduction, and we do surgery uh, when we have a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 60% or left ventricular end systolic diameter of greater than 45 millimeters. Aortic stenosis, these patients don't get medical treatment. It's not effective. They go straight to surgery. These patients do need antibiotic therapy, though, before surgery if we're going to wait on the surgery because it's not severe enough. Uh, and remember the, uh, I didn't put this on here, we do surgery when they have a, uh, their aortic orifice is less than 0 0.8 centimeters squared. Aortic regurge, uh, it is a diastolic murmur like mitral stenosis, and so we give them diuretics. Like any aortic disease, they need antibiotic prophylaxis. We do surgery for these patients when the ejection fraction is less than 55% or the end systolic diameter is greater than 55 millimeters. With mitral valve prolapse, uh, beta blockers are good for the pain if they have it. Uh, we only give them antibiotics if they have the regurgitant systolic murmur. And then hokum, uh, we really just try to uh, avoid the complications of this, which are most prominently arrhythmia and sudden death. So we avoid strenuous activity and we keep hydration to keep that stupid septum out of the way. Uh, and both MVP and hokum rarely ever need surgery. It will never be the right answer on the USMLE. So one more little recap here. Uh, remember that diastolic murmurs always get diuretics, preload reduction, so that's mitral valve stenosis and aortic regurgitation are your diastolic murmurs. Systolic murmurs, which are mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis, always get afterload reduction, which is ACE inhibitors and nitrates, but aortic stenosis, the optimal therapy is surgery. They should go straight to surgery as soon as they have symptoms. Uh, or once their, uh, their aortic orifice is less than 0 0.8 centimeters squared. Any valvular condition can cause AFib. So if they have AFib on their EKG, then you need to treat them. In addition to their medical or surgical therapy, you need to treat them with digoxin and warfarin.
Uh, and then one more thing that deserves a uh, passing mention is to know the association of tricuspid regurgitation and IV drug use. So where are you going to hear tricuspid regurgitation? Well, just like mitral regurgitation, it's going to be a systolic murmur. But you're going to hear this not on the apex, not on the left side, but on the left lower sternal border, which is where you appreciate any tricuspid sound. So here you go. You're going to he hear all your aortic murmurs on the right upper sternal margin, all your uh, pulmonary on the left uh, sternal margin, upper sternal margin, all of your, uh, your tricuspid on the left lower sternal margin, and all of your mitral murmurs on the apex. Um, so all physicians take money. That's how you remember that. Upper right sternal upper left sternal, lower left sternal, apex. There you go. And we'll do a, uh, a more concise uh, uh, talk about the physical exam for the CK. That's it.